Uh, the main thing is that you can see the slides, you can see the photos. I apologize, the photos won't be on your app. There's just too many ways to follow through and make sure that I've gotten all the right, you know, okays by the families. But I can tell you, and what I love now is, and I'm sure you've realized, is that you can easily find photos of any diagnosis you want on the internet. I do have some suggestions in trying to get to a Derm Atlas site as best you can, because I think they're labeled better. We know the diagnoses are, are watched a little closer. As I put up my photos, you'll see that I put some in that I think are good to use. And then um, just you'll find the ones you like and you use often. But it is really made, especially studying you know, for dermatology, much easier and, and a great way to do it. I have a lot of slides. I'm going to go fast. If you have any questions, I'll be at the back at the end, and, and we certainly can go through questions. So none, and then we're just going to keep busy and learn as much as we can here. As far as the overview, I kind of hit eight big areas of dermatology. I'm sure I'm going to miss some. I'm sure some are replicated, and I loved how you guys scored on the ones that related to dermatology that just happened. So you seem ready for dermatology, and then we'll um, just get through. So we're starting out with neonatal, and a lot of this you know well, so I won't spend a lot of time. Sometimes they'll ask specifics about developmental stages, you know, with the skin, so we know the changes that we see in neonatal skin versus, you know, infant or even older children. We're always going to have thinner skin in the neonatal, neonatal period. Believe it or not, many of these babies are hairy, but in, in t total time of the neonatal period, they'll have less hair. They have less active follicular units. Um, we have a weaker epidermal dermal attachment. We know the skin to uh, surface area, their weight ratio is much different and, and relates to a lot of problems. And the percutaneous absorption is just much higher and, and more concerning. As far as skin injury, um, same thing, just those changes we talked about. And then prematurity, that's a, a completely different story. And of course, we have a huge problem with transepidermal water loss and those um, neonates, and they have to be watched closely. You know all about the Vernix. I don't need to tell you a lot, though. We still, in some respect, when you look this up, don't have a lot of information. Um, and it seems that there should be, you know, a, a good amount with every baby that will help their skin as they go on through their neonatal period. As far as umbilical cords, you know, there's some concerns with what we're using and we're finding there's no need to be crazy about cleaning that area. And um, most of the time that they heal and um, will fall off as appropriate. Cutis marmorata, you've all seen. That's not surprising to you. And unfortunately, my, my um, photo is covering up the congenita. On the second one, cutis marmorata, telangiectatica congenita, which is a disorder that can be hard to separate out in the neonatal period from regular cutis marmorata. We're going to talk to it about it when we get to the vascular um, top eight, and uh, we'll, we'll speak more about it, but it will not resolve. It will remain. Typically in the neonatal period, it will look a little bit darker than you would expect most cutis marmorata. And just in case they throw something less common is cutis marmorata alba. So some children actually have like the opposite look, and we believe they have hypertonia of their deep vasculature. Um, but in the end, we'll resolve it and, and do fine. Harlequin color change. So this is most common in our premature babies, but when they're lying on one side, that side tends to look more reddened than the other. It's a fine, uh, I should say, a very sharp line of demarcation. They come and go. They, they lay on their side for a while, and it will um, slowly resolve. Um, and it usually isn't a sign of great concern, except if you see it past that, that early few days of life. And then you might want to look at, is there a problem with the hypothalamus? or severe intracranial injury. Dermal melanocytosis is my fancy word for cerulean spots, um, prior known as Mongolian spots. You know, um, that is irregular transdermal migration of melanocytes. So they didn't migrate across the uh, embryo as the way they should, and you have collections of them giving you that blue-gray color. We know certain um, ethnic backgrounds have a higher risk of it. We know certain locations, of course, the sacrum, buttocks, but you can also have a dorsal hands, dorsal feet. Um, less often on the face, and um, most of the time not real obvious even if it's on the face. However, keep in mind if you have large amounts of the skin surface involved with this, you can have inborn errors in metabolism. 
and this is a sign of those. And then phacomatosis pigmentovascularis is one of our very rare inherited pigmented and vascular disorders. So they won't only have large Mongolian spots, but they also have capillary malformations. Bronze baby syndrome, you guys know all about this and the concern for um, the neonatal jaundice and what needs to be done. Cephalohematomas, I didn't put any pictures in because you've seen them as much as anybody else. And as far as looking at those, if you have any questions, many, many photos on the internet. And the same with a kaput. And we know that with this, it, whether it crosses the midline or not, will give you your diagnosis. Halo scalp ring on this slide is a little less known. And in children that are of large birth weight, um, if they've had enough pressure on their scalp during delivery, they will be delivered with a normal pairing scalp hair. But as the first a month or two occurs, parents will notice a very round halo look of alopecia on the scalp. So it won't be just the posterior scalp, but it involve the parietal and the frontal scalp. That hair will come back, that won't be permanent. It is a pressure effect, similar if you ever had a patient that went through a long surgery and they were laying on their um, uh, posterior scalp for a while, they can lose hair, but it's not a, a scarring alopecia and the hair will come back. Abnormalities of subcutaneous tissues in the neonatal period. Sclerema neonatorum happens more often with our premature infants. Usually there's a very severe underlying disorder and what will happen to the skin is it'll start feeling very firm and hard. Um, it tends to not look like subcutaneous fat necrosis because it won't become as nodular. Subcutaneous fat necrosis can happen in our full term or post mature and most of the time had some problems with delivery and can even have problems with hypercalcemia. Um, this one is easier to find photos and I hope you can see that nodule in the center. What is always hard is when we use the term subcutaneous fat necrosis you would tend to think there'd be atrophy or loss of fat but there's then so much inflammation that it actually is a very firm area. Milli area, so you all know this. This is our um, uh, problem that we'll have, especially in Ohio, if a baby's put in a hot car in the springtime and dressed too warm, or we have a grandma that likes babies to be dressed too warm. And what maybe they would ask is as far as crystallina versus rubra versus profunda. So I tried to get separate photos here, and I think these are pretty good. So your crystallina has very minimal inflammation and you can kind of keep that in mind because it's usually your most superficial occlusion of your eccrine gland and if you run your hand across the skin those all break very easily. Um, the one we typically see is the, the erythematous one in the middle photo there. Um, almost looks like an acneiform but it should be monomorphic where every papule is about the same size. And then the last there is a little bit harder to see is profunda where you might have less erythema but you feel almost a, a very small nodular pattern to the skin. All that will resolve. Definitely the profunda will take longer. I typically tell parents even two to three weeks for that to completely resolve and then really it's just about dressing the child to make sure they're not getting overheated. And the miscellaneous, of course you've seen milia, and that we know these are just small retention cysts of keratin and can happen in a large number of babies. But we do have, if you have a lot of them, concerns. So there is a hereditary trichodysplasia that can have many milia. You can have dystrophic epidermolysis bullosa, that's your EB there. And those kids could have had bullae vesicles in utero and heal with the milia. So it's kind of a key to you. And then rare syndromes like rhombo or the oral facial digital syndrome. And then these similar type of cysts happen, as you know, within the oral mucosa. At the gum line, we call them bones, line, bones cysts, and at the hard palate, Epstein's. And then hyp hyp sebaceous hyperplasia. So this, we believe, is from maternal androgen stimulation, and it's a nice photo there just showing that you can almost see every sebaceous gland on that nose. And that once again, all this is normal and then should slowly resolve as the kids go through their neonatal period. Benign cephalic pustulosis. So, you know, this has really replaced acne neonatorum, and, and it may be a question that they ask because we're trying to get away from that term neonatal acne. Extremely common. These should be monomorphic, where you feel like almost every lesion is of the same size, the same stage as far as erythematous. We believe that it's malazizia 
and I hate to say it, infection, because it's really just an overgrowth, similar to what would call it, cause your cradle cap or um, seborrheic dermatitis. As far as treatment, you know, if it's very severe, it should be controlled, and that can be with an antifungal and decreasing the amount of the malazesia, but also, and I don't have it here, is um, very mild topical steroids would stop the infant's inflammatory response and they would resolve too. And then if it's not severe, of course, just watching it resolve on its own. You know erythema toxicum neonatorum, and as far as that um, differential, you know it's really how it persists. And if you have many pustules, erythematous papules that are persisting, don't keep calling it erythema toxicum. We may need to look at more of the other causes, which can be infectious, uh, can include miliaria we already talked about. Eosinophilic pustular folliculitis, and this is a hard one to get photos on because it's fairly rare, but this is when you're getting recurrent follicular pustules of the scalp and extremities, usually sparing the trunk. In adults, we see this with HIV. In, in infants and children, it's only been reported a, a handful of times, I think even just once in an infant. It can resolve on its own and typically is pruritic. That's probably the worst part for the families is that they're very itchy. When we look at people who have this, they do have a peripheral eosinophilia. And if these pustules continue on through infancy and even toddler years, this might be a child who has hyper IgE, so you might want to think about that. So empatigo neonatorm is not so unusual from any other um, age group, just more concerning, and especially depending on the bacteria that you grow, and especially, you know, as our problems with um, MRSA. So you do want to culture these babies, and I think um, that will be something they will be asking, is culturing is really important as we get to this point of bacterial resistance and making sure that we are um, finding out uh, the sensitivities on these bacteria. Sucking blisters you have seen, and I like this because we're going to talk about an entity that can look similar and is in your differential. These really should heal pretty quickly, not be a big problem. Um, you know, may have you concerned you may culture, but of course should, should not grow anything. Transient neonatal pustular melanosis definitely can be present at birth, can be pustules, but you can also have then the hyperpigmented macules. Um, and that when you, if you would look at these pustules, it's more uh, neutrophils as opposed to our etox or um, the eosinophilic pustular folliculitis. And this is a nice representation. And I've had some babies born with this with almost even um, bullae of pus where they're very, very large. And then what really helps you here, and no matter the skin type of, of the neonate, they should have some hyperpigmented lesions. And um, sometimes you'll see more of those than the pustules, depending on the stage that they're at. Acropustulosis of infancy. So this has been a diagnosis around for a very long time and has always pointed to, well, did this child have scabies? And is this is their immune response after scabies? Well, we certainly have proved that, especially in the large number of children. We have an international adoption here in this country because in some um, orphanages in other countries, scabies goes on for, for months and months at a time. And those children did then come to our country, and we have many reports of this recurrent acropustulosis of infancy, even when they're cleared of the scabies mite. However, we do feel that there may be some babies that could have this without scabies ever. So you can't assume scabies. You really should try to prove it first. If you feel like you've you know, uh, completely negated any chance of scabies, then they need treatment because they're so itchy. And topical steroids and histamines, and if they're very severe, then we go on to Dapsone, um, may be required. Why I wanted this baby acne is because we're trying to get away from that name, but I also wanted you to have the differential. So it's just what we went over, the transient neonatal pustular melanosis, neonatal acne, which we are now trying to call benign cephalic pustulosis, erythema toxicum. Now, we'll talk about infantile acne when we get to the acne sec section, um, but that really should be after six months, and it then should look more like true acne. And then we just discussed acropustulosis of infancy. This is a more rare, I wanted to make sure in case they're bringing up rarer things, um, diagnosis of uh, the neonatal period, and that's congenital erosive vesicular dermatoses. So these children can have extensive ulcers or vesicles, and it can cover up to 75% of their body, and then will heal with severe scarring. So there's a you know huge differential with this, but why I wanted to bring this diagnosis up is that into infancy, these children will have recurrent cages 
cases of HSV. And so when you have a baby who is having HSV, please look at the entire skin surface. It may not be as obvious as this child, um, and just making sure that is not an issue. We are still in the midst of trying to learn more about this disorder and that there really must be something going on in utero that we're missing um, with the severe scarring that's left. Severic dermatitis, so you know this is um, cradle cap, but can occur in other locations. And so here you can see in the diaper area can be quite involved, um, very common in the first couple months of life, and then usually even without treatment will we'll get better as the child gets older. Typically you see that these children will have cradle cap uh, also, and so we really do feel like they have an immune response to even the normal flora yeast that is different than most, and it really should be in your uh, differential for diaper dermatitis. We've tried to get away from this linear disease, but you might see it in a lot of your texts still, and this is just diffuse seborrheic dermatitis. And I think why that was put in and why Dr. Lanier said, geez, we need to separate these kids out, is that we have to remember when we have a diffuse dermatitis, we can have many other diagnoses. Um, one that you, you just had a question on was cystic fibrosis can present in that way. So the failure to thrive should have you triggering, geez, something else is going on. I'm sure a lot of you have seen kids with a lot of seborrheic dermatitis, but they're healthy otherwise. So that's the main thing I want you to understand with the linear disease. Diaper dermatitis. So, you know, um, it's still fairly common for how much better our diaper or diapers have become. And there's multiple reasons. And one that we've had recently, and I'm sure you've seen, is an allergic contact reaction to our wipes. And so as we've become kind of anxious about all bacteria and all um, infectious problems, um, we've created some other issues. So things to think about. First, is there truly another problem going on? And um, is, is there a diaper dermatitis for an issue that we need to address? Chafing dermatitis, and once again, I think I feel like I'm seeing that more now because the parents are wiping so hard, um, using more and more wipes, um, uh, just reasons along that, and that the skin can only tolerate so much. So we need to go back to using some of our barriers, which we really got away from when our diapers became you know, so um, absorbent. Irritant contact, same as chafing, you know, really still will need a good barrier. And then your diaper candidiasis, it's, it presents itself, and I think you can tell when it is candidiasis. And what's nice is I think it, many of our other dermatitis, diaper dermatitis, can then lead to candida. So that's why you guys are always thinking of it. So this is just showing, and especially the chafing. When you have a lot that's not just diaper area, but going on to the inner thighs, we need to think of that. We've come with you know, our elastic and all our diapers, and that can cause problems. Irritant contact, we tend to think the folds will be spared, but I want to be careful with that saying there too, because as I said, if they're doing a lot of wiping at the folds, some parents do that more than others, then the folds might be involved also. And your main thing there is, once again, just a lot of barrier petrolatum, zinc oxide. So if you're not responding, you know, if you thought it was an irritant not getting better, you may want to think about Canada. If you have the more typical satellite lesions or pustules, that might make you want to think about Canada. And then you know we can have a positive KOH if you would uh, scrape those, and then uh, certainly can grow it if that's the issue. And that would be your topical antifungals. The only thing I've seen uh, that makes sure is that the parents use the topical antifungals until the area is cleared. They tend to stop a little bit quick, and then it seems like it comes back right away. Plus, it probably is a child who's still going to need a barrier and that the parents stay on with the barrier. I threw childhood psoriasis in here, though we're going to talk about it later, because I want us to think about childhood psoriasis when we think about diaper dermatitis. Because many of our psoriatic children will present with a fairly severe diaper dermatitis, and then their toddler years, maybe even school age years, not be that affected. They get closer to pre-adolescent, adolescence, and then they have, and it's typically another trigger in childhood psoriasis, so they have the genetic predisposition, but then they get a strep infection or a, another type of infection that will lead to their immune response and their psoriasis. So I just wanted us to keep that in mind. Now our more severe diaper dermatitis, and they may love asking these questions, and I will tell you, when you read on the severe diaper dermatitis, it gets so confusing, and I don't think there's a book that describes it well, um, but what I'll try to do here is show you the common diagnoses, so starting out with granuloma, gluteal, infant. And why it was given that name is if you biopsy, you can get to the point of seeing granulomas here. 
We don't typically biopsy diaper dermatitis unless we have, you know, other reasons. The child is ill for, for whatever reasons. But once they didn't realize this, then they labeled this. But what you should know is that this is really due to a chronic inflama inflammation for many different reasons. Um, and certainly we've looked at, well, those kids probably have more candida and more issues that way. But it's mainly about the skin having a chronic inflammatory process. So you can see with the photos here, that you have these almost separated, and, and kind of to your mind, probably would remind you of granulomas, um, and really is very difficult to treat then. The reason being is that that area who, where the skin has already lost its barrier, eroded, has a huge inflammatory process going on, is constantly exposed to urine and feces. So there is many ways to treat topical steroids, antifungals, antibacterial, but the number one is barrier, 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 because if you cannot protect that skin from the feces, urine, it'll be very difficult to heal it in. So the next very severe diaper dermatitis is perianal pseudoverrucous papules and nodules. So this almost looks like condyloma lata, acuminata. So people get very worried about, uh, you know, sexual abuse in this situation. So be very careful. Typically, these children have a problem. So they are having very loose stools like Hirschsprung and Capricis or the urinary incontinence. So there's probably another reason that they're having it. And when you do have children that have any disorder where, you know, GI-wise, they may be having extremely loose stools, barrier, barrier, barrier. The quicker the parents get on that and prevent, the better. So here's a photo, and this was a French named, as you can see, Jacquet dermatitis um, years ago, and really for all the same reasons is that there was just chronic irritation in this area. And you can see the one photo looks very much like granuloma gluteal, so that's why I have always had trouble labeling these. Quite honestly, in the clinical situation, pick what you want and start treating. Um, I don't think that they will ask you many questions about separating out these names, but in case they do, you've seen them all. Acrodermatitis and repathica can also cause diaper dermatitis, and you know this is our zinc deficiency, and we can have multiple reasons for that. And it typically doesn't involve just the diaper area, but you'll have a severe desquam desquamation of the perioral area, neck, chest. And sometimes these children also have a albumin deficiency and other issues, and so um, you need to look just at the total uh, nutrition of the child. So developmental abnormalities, you went through a few of these, and um, really what I wanted is a list. So you, you know, they show a photo of a lipoma over the sacrum, it's gonna make you think, yep, that means that we may have a midline defect here. You already know that means we are gonna have to, you know, at a young age you can do ultrasound, but if it's older when it's being found, then you may even need MRI. Other skin findings are sacral dimples, sinuses, you know, if there's a skin tag that's very large, Gluteal cleft asymmetry, you're all looking for that. Aplasia cutis congenita, of course, in the midline in certain areas, and we're going to talk further about that. And then a large melanocytic nevus, and so we'll have photos where if you have a good portion of the spine covered with a congenital melanocytic nevus, we need to be looking at underlying developmental di um, disorders or abnormalities. One that, that we can find quite easily and sometimes right at birth is congenital hyper hemihypertrophy, and as you know, with a capillary malformation, it makes us think of clipotronalne, proteus, um, and then the problems that can come with that, and we see that there's 50% of the kids have some other anomaly. The longer we uh, look into capillary malformations and hemihypertrophy, the more we realize that there's multiple genetic disorders that can do this, and probably our best will be to get them to a geneticist, get them diagnosed as quickly as possible. Um, Clipotronalne, we now have the genetic defect, and so we can really help these families much better than we could. Aplasia cutis congenita is the one they wanted to talk about, and that's because you can have it where it's completely, I shouldn't say completely normal, but it doesn't mean that the child needs any scanning or you're worried about any uh, inherited disorders. Um, however, if it's not in certain locations, then you're going to be more concerned. And if it's associated with any other abnormalities, then you be, may be more concerned. And we do have an antithyroid medication that we know has been a teratogen and can lead to this finding. So here we're showing a more common, and they're up close, which is good, but bad, because you can't see that the 
most common location is right at the vertex of the scalp and then going right along the frontal scalp till the lateral canthus of the eye. And in those locations in small, you know, less than two centimeters, we're not greatly worried. Um, it will look almost shiny yellow orange. Sometimes it's so tiny it's not seen right at birth and then the parents come in three months later, it's more obvious to their eyes and they want to blame all the scalp leads. But it's, it's very different and you, you'll be able to pick up on it. It should be allopatic. There should never be hair that grows there. You can't have that diagnosis if you have hair growing there. Um, and it's not a huge problem other than how big it is and as a child grows, will it be obvious that they have an allopatic area. Now, if you have aplasia cutis of the posterior scalp, trunk, anywhere else, you're gonna be looking for other concerns and especially if they already have other anomalies, it might lead us to some diagnoses. Um, I didn't want to um, forget this, though at times it's bullous. So don't be surprised if you have a bullous lesion on the scalp. Many people will go to an infection, want to work up the child. I certainly understand that, but remember that your aplasia cutis congenita can be bullous. Here are the syndromes with aplasia cutis congenita to think about. If you have a large area, especially over the foot shin, you need to think about Bart syndrome, which is our dystrophic epidermolysis bullosa. Um, it will heal, they will do okay, but then you're gonna have ongoing blistering, as you know, with epidermolysis bullosa. And then the other two we worry about is Setless and Adams Oliver, and they typically will have other findings, you know, as they're showing with that photo, a very um, slanted eyebrow, um, sometimes very coarse faces. And then with Adams Oliver, they can have CMTC is cutis marmorata telangiectetica congenita, so it's what we talked about when we talked about cutis marmorata. Developmental defects as we were going through, a dermal sinus is an epithelium lied tract and it usually follows fusion lines so we can see it on the occipital or lumbosacral area. Um, it's difficult to see, you know, sometimes they're very tiny. If the track is completely open, you may have an increased risk of infection. So if you're having a localized infection um, and can't really put your finger on it, make sure that you're looking very closely at the skin and you may just have a tiny little pit that kind of warns you of that. You all have seen dermoid cysts. They can occur really anywhere, but more commonly on the face, scalp. And as you know, the most common is the orbital ridge by the eyebrows. As we get to midline, dermoid cysts, we get more worried that we may have an underlying defect. So cephalocils, um, you know about, you know that they're herniation of the brain tissue through the skull. You, you would have this kind of soft feel to the skull, so it, it really alerts you. It's, it's, it's going to be there more so when the baby cries, so you'll see that kind of changing of it. Mom might say, I don't see it if she's sleeping, but when she cries, so unfortunately sometimes that helps you to see what's going on. And then it should transluminate if it's large enough. You know, it's hard if it's not very large, but if it's large enough, that should happen. And then you might see some midline defects, uh, you know, that point to you that that's a bigger problem. And your differential, and I've had this happen, a lot of people send a hemangioma to me, a deep infantile mangioma, and, and it really wasn't. Remember as much as possible when you diagnose a deep infantile mangioma, it should not be real obvious the first couple weeks of life. You know, those are gonna be slowly growing. So if you have something that's obvious first couple weeks of life, infantile mangioma should drop on your differential diagnosis and think of a cephalocil. Here's a nasal glioma, which is ectopic neuroectoderm, and um, you know, typically it's extranasal, but it can be intranasal, and sometimes you'll just have a wide nasal root. If it's extranasal, it gives you a very blue hue um, and can be somewhat fluctuant. Uh, of course, we'll need surgical excision in ear, nose, and throat. Congenital fistulas of the lower lips. I thought this was good to see in case they show you this photo. And it can be just an autosomal dominant inherited pattern without other anomalies. But of course, if there's any other anomalies, you're going to try to tie it to other genetic problems. There should be an end to this. It shouldn't um, cause a lot of problems as far as infection or having a completely open canal. Developmental defects can also involve skin dimpling, and what they're trying to show with this photo is just that deep crease at the um, nasal root. We have many reasons, and we can even have infectious reasons like congenital rubella, certainly some syndromes. Um, so depending you know, how deep it is, where it's located, if there's other anomalies, same thing as everything we've talked about. It's mainly you picking it up. 
I will tell you what I've seen too is um, at times is such a mild variation of normal. It could be really hard. So it's okay to say the first time you see the baby, not sure, I want to see again, and then also looking for other defects. And this is our amniotic constriction bands. I think this is a nice photo if it was occurring on the back or buttocks. Um, sometimes they're not to the point of firm scarring. If you've ever felt one, they, they typically feel firm and scar. Sometimes you'll just have hyperpigmented lesions um, where the band wasn't tight enough to cause a lot of problems. Um, typically, they shouldn't follow any typical embryonal closure lines, and so that's what kind of stimulate your mind that this is an amniotic band because it really won't have a, a really pathophysiologic kind of distribution. And you probably have all seen preauricular uh, pits and then um, uh, clefts here that can cause these skin tags as you've probably been taught. You know, these can have a fairly deep underlying pit and if you just snip off the top then you can have problems with underlying cysts and infections in the future. If you have multiple of these or, um, or other anomalies you'll think of golden heart syndrome and this can be associated with uh, hearing loss. Here's typical locations of our branchial cleft cysts, which I thought was good for you to see on the lateral neck. A thyroglossal duct cyst would be, you know, at the anterior neck, but midline. And then your bronchogenic cysts are really just above your sternal notch. And so if they show you a, a location, a, a photo, then you'd be able to say which one it is. Other developmental defects, so what they're showing here is actually going back to the last one. So these branchial clefts can be as large as what we call wattles on the sides of the neck there. And then as far as supernumerary nipples, you've probably seen those. Of course, you can have one, maybe it doesn't mean much, but if you have multiple and you have other anomalies, then, then you might be more worried about genetic concerns. On to birthmarks. So I separate them out by pigmented melanocytic vascular mastocytomas, and then the epidermal birthmarks. Um, I actually starting with the more dermal one here, the collagenoma, and this is a plaque, as you know and you just heard, is associated with tuberous sclerosis, but I wanted to show you a photo of it, and um, what I will tell you is these are fairly, this one's even more obvious than they typically are. So these are fairly obscure, and sometimes it's the mom saying, you know, I held the baby and I can feel something right here. And as you palpate, it definitely will feel like the dermis is firmer there, and you almost feel like a drop off as you're getting to the normal skin. So you'll be able to tell, but believe me, it's not the most obvious, and it's often one found by the parents and brought to us. You can have a collagenoma without tuberous sclerosis and other genetic disorders, but if you see a collagenoma and you have any concerns for tuberous sclerosis, you know that's the first thing you'd think of. Smooth muscle hamartomas, I also find these very obscure, and so what this is is that there is extra smooth muscle from the, the slip of muscle that we have that causes our hair to stand up and um, gives us goosebumps. So you can have many, many of these slips of smooth muscle in the skin, and it will firm up the skin similar to a collagenoma. Um, sometimes it's obvious right at birth, and sometimes it's not till there's some hormonal stimulation from um, puberty. So when that happens, we tend to call it Becker's Nevis syndrome, so, so you guys um, know the difference there. What's nice is for you to see the photo. So this is a child pre-adolescent. One of the things that should strike you right away with a smooth muscle hamartoma is the hypertrichosis. Usually the hair within it is very terminal, darker, longer. Now, that can also happen with congenital melanocytic nevi, and sometimes our congenital melanocytic nevi do not have a lot of pigment, so you, your differential may be that, and sometimes it's not until you do a biopsy. Um, if you have just a smooth muscle hematoma in a completely healthy child, there's not a re reason to necessarily biopsy. You can watch for a while and make sure there's no other concerns. Congenital melanocytic nevi, we still separate out small, medium, large. I think what you'll hear the most and is that with our very um, large ones over the midline, we have our highest risk of having problems with melanoma in those children. So those are the ones where we still really try to go at surgically, try to look for leptomeningeal involvement. Um, but now our large ones on the limbs, there's a great debate whether they all have to be excised or they can be followed because we believe the risk is, is low enough. And the surgeries cause such high morbidity that um, many are being left on and followed closely. 
So here's the one that you're going to worry about. So some people will call this a, a bathing suit trunk nevus, um, but most of the back sacrum. Here's another time where you'll be worried about underlying defects, and these kids certainly need to be followed closely um, and excising as much as we can, as you know, with tissue expanders. Um, they get many satellite nevi. As you can see, the child's dotted really everywhere. Um, there is a time where we didn't believe melanoma could come in the satellite le lesions. That is not true, so every nevus on them needs to be followed very, very closely. Cafe au lait macule. So I wanted to give you a differential of what you think about. Everybody thinks about NF, but we definitely have other genetic disorders that have cafe au lait and macules. And to keep in mind that a good portion of children who have cafe au lait macules are completely healthy, as you found 33% of normal children. Tuberous sclerosis is one, and I think that was brought up with your question. Mucuna albright, leopard, and our, our P10 hamartoma, um, they all can have cafe au laits. Neva simplex, so you know these are the red patches that we'll see, midline forehead, sometimes over the eyes, paranasal and upper lip. They tend to fade. However, some may reappear as a child cries. The posterior scalp ones tend to remain even into adulthood. Not typically a problem unless you're finding other um, birthmarks of concern, as we brought up before, phacomatosis, pigmentovascularis, the children can have more nevi simplex. Mastocytomas is fairly common, though we don't have a good epidemiologic study to say how many kids have this. This can be in your differential blistering, and I'll show you the photo, so that's why I brought it up with the sucker blisters. Um, if you just have one, the child really has no concerns and will be fine. When we do have one that presents in infancy, we should watch the child to make sure they don't have more lesions coming up and can go on to a form of mastocytosis called urticaria pigmentosa. So here's one that's almost to the point of blistering. That may occur if that was stroked just the right way, mom scratched the back, or the baby had a fairly warm bath can bring it out also. Now when it's not indurated or inflamed, it can look very much like a nevus, as you can see with that bottom photo also. It is in our differential for abuse. You know, it can be the size of what you would think could burn a child, and so keep that in mind. So getting onto inflammatory dermatoses, and as you can see, we have a lot. I'm going to try to hit them as quick as possible. One is our atopic dermatitis and our ability to learn more and more about what it's causing, uh, what, what causes it, and what we can do. And there's multiple um, mutations that are being found, so that's going to be the hard part. And we're probably going to find atopic dermatitis as a wastebasket term, and we need to separate these kids out and, and may be able to do that at some point due to their genetics. However, still the majority of them have an epidermal defect. And if we can get the families to understand this, we can make a huge difference with eczema. And we have many studies to show exactly what's going on. I won't go through that all. But that's why the moisturization is so critical. So um, especially now as we look at kids that have been pretty severe, parents are coming and wanting prevention. What can I do for the next baby? You know, it really is to do the daily skin care. And they need to picture that their child's skin is not normal, even when it is looking normal. Normal. And I think that's where I've, uh, you know, uh, just really had the hardest time. Um, we really have more than enough studies to show bathing every day with a mild soap and moisturizing does not dry out the skin. Um, it's what soap we use, it's putting the moisturizer on, using the right moisturizer, all those things can change the patient's perception, or I should say the parent's perception of how the bathing works. But really this is common practice for every child that has atopic dermatitis and should be for their family members. So as we talked about, people have tried to look beyond genetics. Everybody's looked at everything. I could go on and on. There's study after study. Really, we don't have a lot of proof of anything, unfortunately, and that we'll probably find, like I said, there's just multiple genetic hits. So from research to practice, main thing is what we've learned about the epidermis is that we've got to moisturize. So here's our typical infantile um, atopic dermatitis patients. When I think of diagnoses that they may ask you therapies on, this is one that I thought they might. So once I can, I can bet you for sure they're going to want to know that you know these kids need to be moisturized. Um, ceramides are what we've proven is missing from their skin. There's certainly other molecules, but right now that's our most common one you can find in our over-the-counter moisturizers, so families should be looking for that. And then topical steroids. I think the question they may ask you is, are we really trying to get away from intermittent dosing? Two weeks on, two weeks off, five days on, five days off, however you do it. 
and both the AED and the AAP believe that we can do weaning doses where you might start out twice a day, week or two, once a day, week or two, and trying to get down to twice a week dosing. And in doing that, then we can utilize these medications without having the side effects. Um, common, you guys have seen this over and over again, the lichenified plaque and erosions at the flexural surface, and this is what we're gonna see more in the school age and adolescent age. So with those kids still staying with the strict moisturization, of course they don't want baths, they want showers, I'm fine with that, they just need to make sure they're moisturizing. Um, next is the, the potency of the topical steroid. You know, I think going even up to a three on, on teens is absolutely fine. Sometimes I find if I don't go up in potency, then I can't get them controlled as well, and I'm actually using more topical steroid than going to the higher potency. Of course, antihistamines, and really our most recent um, Studies don't show that they're great for itch at all, and the topical steroids work better for itch, but we have reasons that they need the antihistamines. Many of these kids have aeroallergens and other atopy uh, findings, and that's where they're helpful. Um, definitely increased oil production in the adolescent years can complicate atopic dermatitis. Um, so when they have more oil produced on the scalp, they're gonna have more yeast production, and then they're gonna have more inflammation. So these kids may have more problems with um, scalp and facial acne, or sorry, facial atopic dermatitis as they become teens. And you've all read on dilute bleach baths and our reasons to use those. Um, I think that we have more than enough studies to sh say why they're helpful and enough research on pathophys wise with atopic derm to say why they're helpful. Um, I will, and they may bring this up, uh, find that you know, a well-chlorinated swimming pool can do what a dilute bleach bath can. So here in Ohio in the summer months at least we can utilize that. Eyelid dermatitis, they may ask about this, and this is one of our biggest problems because we cannot use topical steroids on the eyelids and risk of glaucoma. Increase ocular pressure, um, and then increase infections. So with these kids, you know, we really lean to our tacrolimus, which is, is protopic, or um, elidil pomicrolimus, and really can use it on a daily basis to keep them controlled. I think the better you can control them, the less problems you're gonna have with infection. As you can see here, she's starting to look crusted and we probably have some staff growing. So with eyelid dermatitis, think of aeroallergens. Um, I find when I ask families, uh, very few <laughs> children actually wipe their lids. They don't like water on their face and don't actually, when they're washing their face, wash their lids. Um, and then consider allergic contact dermatitis with the eyelids too. We know the lids have a higher risk of having allergic contact just because of the thinness of the lids. We tend to start putting things on um, that we feel are safer and may actually cause more problems in this country. We've gone to natural products and feel like everything's safer because it's natural, but we know that we can have many plant allergic contact dermatitides. And then like I said, the atacrolimus or pomicrolimus daily. So allergic contact dermatitis, I think they're going to hit you hard with this in that um, we for years thought kids didn't have this and now we know they do. And so we really need, when we're seeing a, a dermatitis that's not fitting a pattern, especially that fits atopic dermatitis, to think of these others. So I've given you a list there, as, as you can see, even toilet seat um, dermatitis. And uh, the pattern should help you. You should stop yourself if you say, geez, why is it in this location? When I know it's a teen with atopic dermatitis, you know, why are we getting the shin so bad? So, so those things will, will definitely trigger your mind and make you think of these diagnoses. Cutaneous findings of psoriasis to another inflammatory disorder. You know, what's nice is most of you know the lesions of psoriasis. There's not anything too unusual. Make sure you understand the pitting of the nails, which is important, especially as we look at psoriatic arthritis. One thing you may not know, and we have recent studies to really prove out, that children have facial psoriasis. And I feel bad because this isn't as obvious as it was if you were seeing this patient in person. Um, but, you know, it really can be faci facially deforming and very important to these kids to get to treatment and make sure we can control it as quick as we can. So looking at the comorbidities is a very big deal in pediatric dermatology, especially because we prove so much with the adult psoriasis. So definitely with our children, you want to look at that. And we have studies to show that we have a much higher rate of pediatric psoriasis in our obese children. And so especially in families where you feel like, geez, is there something going on beyond our typical poor eating, not, not exercising, and making sure that they're getting to whoever needs to work them up. 
Arthritis in pediatrics, you know, really comes pretty young. So if you have a teen that's diagnosed with psoriasis, they have a greatly decreased risk of it. Um, I never say never, but definitely wouldn't be as concerned. What's nice is typically that it's going to be severe enough you're going to pick up on it. But I do like bringing it up to parents. If I get a diagnosis young with psoriasis, that they understand what do you look for when a child's starting to have joint problems. Um, and then, as, as I just said, typically if it's an older child, not as worried about the arthritis, but younger we are. Definitely quality of life concern, and that's been huge for many of our uh, chronic skin disorders, and you've seen all the commercials. So we've come to realize the quality of life for people who have chronic skin disorders is terrible. And so it's helped us not only with research, um, but, but better medications, and really accepting the fact that these these poor individuals really need help psychologically, and so keeping that in mind, I won't be surprised if they ask you questions along that route. Therapeutics, I'm gonna go through this quickly because I'm running out of time, but mainly, you know, it's that we can go on to systemic medications when they're severe. If, if we feel like there's not much skin surface area, we can use topicals, we still use topical steroids. Calcipatrion might be one you're less well known with, and that is a vitamin D analog that is very safe. Typically cannot use alone, have to use it with topical steroids, but it is somewhat steroid sparing, so we can use less steroids. Narrowband UVB is our UV light treatment that the patients will come in for. I do utilize safe sun exposure in the summers um, here in Ohio, and that can definitely help. Finally would be, I want to get to our biologics. So we just had a Tannercept approved for up to uh, four years and older, um, which is a great biologic. We're a little frustrated in dermatology because we feel like there's some that are even better for psoriasis, but this is the company that went for the approval. Um, I think you're going to see a lot more trickle down, and our biologics for psoriasis are so much more effective than what we've had in the past. Acne, four areas I need you to drill into your mind, and when you're treating acne, you need to think about these areas. I'm going to go fast through this. Infantile acne does occur. It should occur six months older, separate from neonatal acne, extremely difficult to treat, and I find it's most difficult because your hands are kind of tied on what you can do. Most of the things we would use for adolescents we can't use at this age. Greatest concern is if you feel like you're leaving scarring, that the lesions are big enough. If not, then the kids typically do better and coming closer to two, three, will grow out of it, but then maybe that child that has severe acne is a teen. Comodal acne, you've probably seen. Inflammatory pustules, uh, what I wanted you to see here is on hyperpigmented skin, it may not look as erythematous, but this is a child who has moderate inflammatory acne. Um, then going on to your nodulocystic. We can have frictional acne if they show you a photo where it's very localized, and so a child's wearing a cap over and over again. If you, you know, could change that pattern, you'll do a lot for that. Acne excoriate, they may show you a photo of this and a child that is giving us signs of, um, you know, having some uh, internal stress. It is their way of dealing with it, and it certainly is very difficult when you have acne and they're picking at it to get them better. Here I just wanted you to see post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. So in your darker pigmented patients, acne is a completely different story. It can leave this spotting that lasts for months, sometimes years. So you need to jump on their treatment so they aren't left with all this post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Going through treatment, you guys have all this, but it's topical retinoids is our number one. When we're looking at keratinization, it's going to be chemical pills. And then finally, if very severe, it's Accutane. I'm not going to go through all those. Sebum production. So we've got to decrease sebum production. In some kids, that's their number one problem. Accutane works great at that, but you're not always going to jump to that. So you might want to start with oral contraception, which can work well, spironolactone. Um, believe it or not, corticosteroids, which I only use when, not, you know, for whatever reason, I can't use anything else, and very less often cimetidine. Microorganisms, so we definitely believe that even our topical retinoids can help with the microorganisms that contribute to acne. So when you're using a topical retinoid, you're actually going after that also. Of course, we have benzoyl peroxide and our topical antibiotics, and you probably know the systemic antibiotics, probably the number one thing we've learned recently and will be uh, what you'll be asked, is that we should not be using these chronically. Typically, people are recommending two to four at the most six months courses um, over one to two years if, if 
they're not improving with it, not continuing with the topical, with, sorry, with the systemic antibiotics and going on to Accutane. Getting the inflammatory response, the topical retinoids, the systemic antibiotics do that, not just kill bacteria, and of course the isotretinoin. I'm going to go through quickly here to combination treatments and that when we put benzoyl peroxide with our topical medicines, clindamycin, we definitely find that we have less resistance. So if you have a child that's using a topical antibiotic, you really should have them using a wash, at least with the benzoyl peroxide. Go past that. And just to get to our other topics, I'm going to skip here. Perioral dermatitis is one of your differentials for acne. Lichen planus is another inflammatory dermatosis, very detailed, very specific lesions, meaning looks just like this. So when um, they put a photo up like this, it really is nothing else. So um, lichen planus, you can see many photos on the internet, very rare in children, is treated very similar to psoriasis. This is showing the oral lesions that could come with it. And then linear IgA, as far as our bullous diagnoses, is the most common in children. What I wanted you to see in case they do show you a photo is that you'll get this typical string of pearls that tends to come round and sometimes in little vesicles that are coalesced to a round circle. Things that you should remember is that it can be triggered by antibiotics and that they can very rarely but have an IgA nephropathy, so they should be followed by renal also. The treatment is Dapso, and it really does work very well, and um, the kids usually will outgrow this, as it says, self-resolving. I do have some uh, children that have gone on two to three years with it, but then did resolve. So our hypersensitivity reactions, and you know, the, really the big ones I wanted you to think about was urticaria, serum sickness-like reaction, um, and then reactions to, uh, that we call DRESS, drug reaction, we, the eosinophilia and systemic symptoms, and then of course our Stevens-Johnson and TEN. So urticaria you know enough about, but I wanted just some good photos, and definitely a common diagnosis in children, most commonly brought on by infection, so looking at an underlying etiology, and then keeping in mind that they typically need antihistamines for quite a while afterwards, and I tell parents, you know, four to six months we may need antihistamines. Certainly you can try to stop them in between there, but I'm never surprised if they have recurrence of their urticaria. Serum sickness-like reaction, I thought this photo from um, one of the articles uh, really showed nice that you want to burn in your head, that you'll have very urticarial-like lesions, but the central portion becomes very violaceous. So some people like to call this purple urticaria or erythema multiforme urticaria. Really what you should remember is that this is serum sickness-like reaction, so especially if you had them on a medication you're concerned of, you're thinking of that. It can happen without medications and be um, triggered by infections, and uh, certainly these kids are ill. So besides having the cutaneous lesions, they usually have an arthropathy, they do not want to walk, are uncomfortable. Still self-resolving. People will use systemic steroids. I do think it helps. My concern is that I think they also need antihistamines, and if you don't keep them on the antihistamines, um, then as you stop the steroids, it comes back, and they just keep going through recurrent bouts. Dress is what we know as drug hypersensitivity syndrome or drug-related eosinophilia with systemic symptoms. Why I wanted to bring this one up is that we can see this with our anti-seizure medications, some of our antibiotics like minocycline, and that it can be, what I wanted was the photos, can be fairly non-concerning, and that you don't have the raised lesions or indurated lesions like urticaria, but you should have a fairly diffuse erythema. They don't typically get oral or um, ocular involvement, um, but the red really should be head to toe. And definitely, they usually have uh, arthropathies and not feeling well and seem as almost though they have um, the flu. And then finally, Stevens-Johnson. Whether it goes on to TEN or not is still in debate, but I think the main thing now we have realized is looking at the percentage of the body involved. That's what matters most. Um, the amount the, of new coastal surfaces involved and then getting them to proper treatment. And so as you know, a child like this would really need to get to a burn unit. And um, really, uh, we have much better medications than we've had before. And in adults, we typically use IVIG with great results. We're trying to do more studies on children to show that it would help just as much. Apologize for not getting through it all, but thank you for your patience.